In the still of the night, the dimly lit room was filled with the soft tapping of keyboard keys. Sarah, her eyes heavy yet determined, scrolled through page after page of ancient scripts and modern tales of contacting the dead. The glow from the computer screen cast shadows across her face, highlighting the mix of hope and desperation in her eyes. She had been on this path since Tom's death left an unbearable silence in her life, a path that led her to the occult, to something that promised a whisper from beyond. Her quest had brought her to a forgotten corner of the attic, where she found the Ouija board hidden under a layer of dust and neglect. It was an old piece, its wood darkened by time, with letters that seemed to whisper secrets of a forgotten age. Sarah felt a chill run down her spine as she traced the ornate planchette with her fingers. She had read the stories, the warnings, but the ache in her heart silenced any doubts. Tonight, she would call out to Tom seeking one last farewell, one final moment of solace. With the scene set, candles flickering in a protective circle around her, Sarah placed her fingertips lightly on the planchette. Tom, she whispered into the darkness, her voice a mix of fear and longing. If you're there, please speak to me. For a moment, there was silence, a suffocating, dense silence that seemed to engulf the room. Then the planchette stirred, inching across the board with a life of its own. Heart racing, Sarah watched as it spelled out, hello, sister. Tears brimmed in Sarah's eyes. Tom, is it really you? The planchette moved again, affirming her hope. But there was something else, a sinister undertone to the energy in the room, something Sarah chose to ignore in her moment of grief. As the session advanced, the entity made its offer, disguised in the comforting veil of Tom's voice. It spoke of a pact, a way to bring Tom back, to break the barrier between life and death. Sarah, her judgment clouded by sorrow, didn't see the trap. She heard only what her heart desired most, a chance to undo fate. Yes, she whispered, sealing the pact with a tear that fell upon the board. The candles flared as a cold breeze swept through the room, and the planchette suddenly went still. The room felt heavier, charged with an unspoken energy that Sarah could neither understand nor escape. In that moment, she had crossed a threshold, stepping into a world that was not meant for the living. The pact was made, the path irrevocably chosen. Sarah sat in the dim afterglow of the candles, unaware of the cost of her longing, of the shadow that now clung to her soul. The whisper in the dark had answered, but it was not the one she sought. It was something much older, much more cunning, and it had its own desires. In the weeks that followed, Sarah's obsession with the occult deepened. Each night was spent in whispered conversations with the entity, her room transformed into a shrine of ancient tomes and esoteric symbols. The sun seemed to rise and set without her notice, the world outside fading into a distant memory. Yet amidst the shadows of her new reality, a flicker of light persisted, Mia. Mia noticed the change in her friend, the dark circles under Sarah's eyes, the way she flinched at casual touches as if coming into contact with another world. Concern morphed into fear as Mia found the Ouija board hidden under Sarah's bed, its surface etched with unfamiliar symbols that seemed to writhe under her gaze. Confrontation was inevitable. Mia, armed with the courage that only true friendship can inspire, approached Sarah, her words laced with worry. Sarah, this, this isn't you. You're losing yourself to something dangerous. Sarah's reaction was visceral, a mix of anger and fear flashing across her features. You don't understand, Mia. Tom, he's coming back to me. There's a way, and I'm close. The words hung between them, a chasm that threatened to swallow their friendship whole. It was in this moment of tension, of raw emotion, that the entity chose to reveal itself. The air chilled, the shadows deepening, as a voice not quite Tom's and not quite Sarah's echoed through the room. She's mine now. We have a pact. This revelation shattered the last of Sarah's denial. The entity wasn't her brother. It was something else entirely, something malevolent that had woven itself into the fabric of her life. Mia, despite the terror gripping her heart, stood firm. We're going to fix this, Sarah. We're going to break this pact. Together, they embarked on a journey into the unknown. Research replaced whispered conversations with the entity. Ancient libraries traded for forbidden knowledge. They sought a counter ritual, a way to sever the bond that tethered Sarah to the darkness. Their friendship, tested by fear and the creeping influence of the entity, 
found new strength in a shared resolve. Preparation for the counter ritual was a testament to their determination. They gathered sacred herbs, candles of purest white, and symbols of protection, transforming Sarah's room from a shrine of darkness into a beacon of hope. The night of the ritual arrived, a crescent moon watching over them as they painted protective circles and chanted ancient verses. The very air seemed to thrum with anticipation, the boundary between worlds thinning as they stepped forward to reclaim Sarah's soul from the shadows. As the protective circles glowed with a soft, ethereal light, Sarah and Mia stood at the precipice of the unknown, the counter ritual their only hope against the looming darkness. With hands clasped and breaths held, they began, their voices rising in a chant that seemed to echo through the fabric of reality itself. The ritual was a battle not of physical might, but of wills, as the entity, enraged by their defiance, lashed out. The room twisted, shadows stretching into grotesque shapes, and the temperature plummeted, frost creeping across the windows. Through the chaos, Sarah faced hallucinations of Tom, each more twisted and malevolent than the last, a cruel mockery of her grief. But it was not in the darkness that Sarah found her strength, it was in the light of her memories, in the love she held for her brother. With each recollection, Sarah's resolve solidified, her voice growing steadier as she confronted the entity, not as a vengeful spirit, but as the embodiment of her own despair. I accept that Tom is gone, Sarah declared, her voice breaking through the cacophony of the entity's rage, and I let go of this pain. The words were a beacon, a final blow that shattered the entity's hold. The room trembled as if expelling a long-held breath, the shadows receding and the air warming. When the light returned, the entity was gone, banished back to the void from which it had come. Sarah slumped to the ground, exhausted but free, the bond severed. In the aftermath, as dawn streaked the sky with hues of pink and gold, Sarah and Mia sat amidst the remnants of the ritual, a silent testament to their ordeal. They spoke little, the experience a shared burden that words could scarcely convey. Yet, in their silence, a new understanding blossomed. Sarah, though forever marked by her encounter with the darkness, had emerged with a clearer vision of life and death, of the thin veil that separates joy from despair. The story of that night became a whispered legend, a cautionary tale of grief and desperation, of the cost of delving too deep into the shadows. But for Sarah, it was more than a lesson. It was a rebirth, a second chance to live not in the past, but in the present, cherishing the memories of those she had lost not as chains, but as wings. And as the sun rose, casting light into the once dark room, Sarah realized that true closure came not from reaching into the darkness, but from embracing the light. With Mia by her side, she stepped forward into a new day, leaving the Ouija board and the broken pact behind a distant memory of the night she danced with shadows and emerged into the dawn. Under the dim glow of a solitary attic light bulb, the aged pages of forgotten stories and relics of bygone eras lay strewn across the floorboards. It was here, amidst the clutter of the past, that Alex, Jamie, and Max discovered an artifact that would irrevocably alter the trajectory of their lives. Buried under a pile of dusty books and disregarded trinkets was an ancient Ouija board, its wood stained by the passage of time, yet the letters and numbers etched upon its surface seemed to pulsate with an unseen energy. It's just a board game, right? Max's voice, tinged with a mix of skepticism and wonder, echoed in the cramped space. Jamie, ever the thrill seeker, answered with a spark in her eyes. More than that, it's a gateway. Let's see what secrets it holds. Her curiosity was infectious, and even Alex, the skeptic of the group, found themselves drawn to the mysterious allure of the board. Gathered around the relic, each placed a fingertip on the planchette, their breaths held in anticipation. Alex's rational mind churned, ready to dismiss the impending carade as mere coincidence and suggestion. Yet, when the planchette began to glide across the board with a life of its own, spelling out a greeting from an entity named Erebus, Skepticism gave way to an inexplicable sense of dread. The entity's offer was simple, a wish granted in exchange for a pledge of loyalty. The temptation dangled before them like forbidden fruit, sweet with promise. Jamie's laughter cut through the thickening atmosphere, her ambition casting shadows over the potential consequences. 
Imagine the possibilities, she whispered, her voice a mix of excitement and greed. In the days that followed, the wistful desires voiced in the darkness of that attic began to manifest in the light of day. Jamie's burgeoning social media presence exploded overnight, catapulting her into the virality she had dreamed of. Max, whose humor often masked his deep-seated insecurities, found his academic efforts recognized with a prestigious scholarship, his future suddenly alight with promise. Alex watched as their friends basked in the glow of their newfound fortunes, a gnawing unease settling in the pit of their stomach. It was too coincidental, too perfect. Their skepticism had been silenced by the outcomes they witnessed, but not eradicated. The skepticism transformed into a creeping dread, the kind that slithers into one's thoughts in the dead of night, whispering of unseen costs and shadowy debts yet to be collected. The ancient Ouija board, once a curious relic, now sat as a malevolent specter in the corner of their collective consciousness. Its silent promise of desires fulfilled, overshadowed by the unspoken threat of prices unpaid. The path they had unwittingly embarked upon was paved with more than just wishes and whispers, and the darkness that lay ahead was deeper and more consuming than the shadows that filled the attic where their journey began. As the newfound fortunes of Jamie and Max flourished, a dark undercurrent began to weave its way through the fabric of their lives. Odd accidents started occurring with alarming frequency around them, each incident seemingly disconnected yet eerily reflective of the wishes they had whispered into the void. Jamie's followers, once adoring fans, turned obsessive, leading to stalking incidents and invasions of privacy that left her feeling exposed and vulnerable. Max, while initially reveling in his academic accolades, started experiencing sabotage from envious peers, turning his dream into a waking nightmare. Alex, the observer, the skeptic turned reluctant believer, couldn't shake the feeling that these misfortunes were not mere coincidences. They were the sinister echoes of the promises made in the attic, the shadow price of the desires granted by Erebus. Driven by a need to protect their friends and uncover the truth, Alex delved into the history of the Ouija board and the entity that had identified itself so ominously. Late nights filled with research turned into a haunting revelation. The board was not just an artifact, it was a conduit, previously owned by a diabolical cult dedicated to Erebus, a figure rooted in darkness and deceit. This entity was not a benign spirit, but a harbinger of chaos, bound to the board and seeking ever to expand its influence through bargains struck in naivety and greed. Armed with this knowledge, Alex convened another session with the board, a desperate attempt to confront Erebus and renegotiate the terms of their agreement. As the planchette moved under their collective touch, spelling out chilling responses, the air in the attic thickened, oppressive with the presence of the unseen. You are mine, the board spelled, each letter a tightening noose around their fates. The pact is sealed, bound by desire. In that moment, the friends realized the grim reality of their situation. Erebus did not merely grant wishes, it ensnared souls, weaving their essence into the fabric of its own dark machinations. The accidents, the misfortunes, were but a taste of the chaos Erebus could unleash should they attempt to break the bond. The fear that gripped them was palpable, a living thing that whispered of dark paths unwalked and fates yet unwoven. The pact with Erebus, once an enticing promise, now loomed over them as a sinister pact forged in naivety, a shadow from which they desperately sought escape but saw no path clear. Amidst the chilling realization, a glimmer of hope flickered. The bond could be broken, but at a cost yet unknown, a sacrifice that could demand more than any of them were prepared to give. The seed of rebellion was planted in that revelation fueling a determination to reclaim their destinies from the clutches of Erebus's dark influence. The realization of their grim predicament spurred Alex, Jamie, and Max into desperate action. They understood the only way to sever the bonds with Erebus was through an act of selflessness, a sacrifice that would nullify the pact rooted in their own desires. The haunting words of Erebus, the pact is sealed, bound by desire, echoed in their minds a sinister reminder of the entity's hold over them. Their research into the occult and the history of the diabolic cult provided them with a glimmer of hope. They learned that Erebus, bound by ancient rules, 
could be compelled to release them if they offered something of equal or greater value than what they had received. The friends knew this meant more than mere physical offerings. It demanded a sacrifice of the deepest part of themselves. In a decisive act of courage, they returned to the attic for one final encounter with Erebus. The planchettes trembled under their fingers as they called forth the entity, its presence now a palpable force in the suffocating darkness of the room. Alex, whose skepticism had once shielded them from belief in the occult, stepped forward as the one to make the ultimate sacrifice. They offered a piece of their essence, the very skepticism that defined their being, in exchange for the freedom of their souls and the nullification of the pact. With a heavy heart but a resolved spirit, Alex watched as the planchette moved across the board, spelling out Erebus's acceptance of the offer. A violent gust of wind swept through the attic, extinguishing the lights and leaving them in darkness. When the air stilled and the light returned, the oppressive feeling that had lingered over them was gone. Erebus had released them, but the cost was evident in the weight of the silence that followed. In the aftermath of their ordeal, the friends found themselves irrevocably changed. Jamie's ambition had been tempered by the understanding of the dangers hidden behind unchecked desires. Max, having tasted the bitterness of envy and sabotage, learned to appreciate the value of true achievement. And Alex, who had sacrificed a part of their essence to save them all, emerged as a believer in the mysteries they once dismissed, their skepticism replaced by a deep understanding of the occult's realities. As they went their separate ways, each carrying the scars of their experiences, they were united by the bond forged in the darkness of that attic, a bond not of fear, but of the profound realization of the price of their desires. Alex, in particular, carried the weight of their sacrifice, a constant reminder of the night when the veil of skepticism was lifted, revealing a world where the occult was not just a subject of fascination, but a reality to be respected and feared. In the end, it was Alex who took up the mantle of warning others against the lure of the occult, a mission born from their personal loss and the lessons learned from their brush with the darkness. They became a guardian of sorts, a beacon for those tempted by the whispers of entities like Erebus, ensuring that no one else would fall into the same trap. Through this act of selflessness, Alex not only fulfilled their part of the bargain, but also found a new purpose, standing as a sentinel against the shadows they once doubted, forever changed by the true cost of desire. There's a peculiar kind of fascination that lingers on the edges of our understanding, one that both terrifies and compels us toward the mysteries of the unseen world. My name is Mark, and my entire life has been a testament to this inexplicable draw toward the occult. Maybe it was the countless hours spent devouring books on paranormal phenomena or the late night horror movie marathons that sparked this interest, but nothing could have prepared me for the night that would change everything. It was a crisp autumn evening, the kind where the chill in the air whispers secrets of the changing seasons. My friends, Emma, Lucas, and I had ventured into the heart of an abandoned asylum on the outskirts of town. The asylum with its decaying facade and air steeped in forgotten tragedy had long been the subject of whispered legends in our college town. I convinced Emma and Lucas that this was the perfect location for our Ouija board experience a decision propelled more by my curiosity than by the bravado I pretended to possess. We set up our makeshift seance in what must have once been the asylum's common room. Moonlight filtered through the broken windows, casting eerie shadows across the peeling walls. The Ouija board, an old wooden piece I'd found in a thrift shop, sat at the center of our circle, almost reverberating with a silent power. With a mix of skepticism and anticipation, we placed our fingers lightly on the planchette, and I cleared my throat, attempting to hide the tremor in my voice. If there are any spirits here with us, would you make your presence known? I asked, half expecting our experiment to fail. To our collective shock, the planchette twitched beneath our fingers, slowly gliding towards the yes. A chill that wasn't solely from the cold night air swept through the room. Emma's eyes widened, her usual skepticism momentarily replaced with fear. Lucas, ever the enthusiast, grinned with excitement, 
his belief in the supernatural manifesting before his eyes. I pushed down the nerves bubbling in my stomach and asked another question, who are you? The planchette moved with more confidence this time, spelling out a response that would haunt me, F-A-M-I-L-Y. The word hung in the air between us like a specter, raising questions I hadn't anticipated. Before we could delve deeper, inexplicable shadows danced across the walls, as if responding to the revelation. The atmosphere thickened with an unspoken tension, an awareness that we were not alone. Convinced we had awakened something within the crumbling walls of the asylum, we decided to delve into its history and my family's connection to this place. My initial research uncovered unsettling truths. The asylum's founder bore my surname, a detail my parents had conveniently never mentioned. His legacy, marked by innovative yet controversial treatments, was shrouded in mystery and rumors of cruelty. The deeper I dug, the more vivid my nightmares became. Every night, I wandered the twisted halls of the asylum in my sleep, encountering the lingering spirits of its past. Each dream revealed fragmented pieces of history, guiding me towards an understanding of the power I had unknowingly awakened. The whispers of the asylum had become my own, setting me on a path I could no longer avoid. My friends noticed the change in me, the obsession that consumed my waking moments. Despite their concerns, or perhaps because of them, we were inexorably pulled deeper into the mystery of the asylum and the spirits that called it home. As the nights drew on, my dreams intensified, evolving into vivid experiences that left me questioning the boundaries between the waking world and the astral plane. One night, in the midst of a particularly lucid dream, I found myself wandering the derelict halls of the asylum once again. This time, however, I encountered a benign spirit, a young woman clothed in the faded hospital gown of a bygone era. Her demeanor was calm, her gaze piercing yet filled with sorrow. She spoke without moving her lips, her voice resonating directly within my mind. You have the gift, she said, the ability to bridge our worlds. Awakening from the dream, the clarity of her voice still lingering in my ears, I was startled by the realization that these were not just dreams. I was communicating with the spirits that haunted the asylum. The revelation was both exhilarating and terrifying. I confided in Lucas, who had always believed in the supernatural more than anyone else I knew. Lucas listened intently, his eyes bright with fascination. You're a medium, Mark, he said, his voice tinged with excitement. You have a connection to the spirit world that most can only dream of. Under Lucas's guidance, and with a mixture of trepidation and determination, I began to explore and understand my newfound abilities. We started with simple exercises, attempting to contact the spirits around us. At first, my attempts were clumsy, often leaving me exhausted and with a pounding headache. But as time passed, I became more adept at focusing my energy and channeling the spirits' messages. Emma, though skeptical, supported me through this journey. Her practicality provided a grounding force, balancing Lucas's and my enthusiasm with caution and logic. Just be careful, Mark, she would often say, her concern evident in her piercing blue eyes. We don't fully understand what you're dealing with. Our experiments grew bolder, and I found myself acting as a conduit for the spirits of the asylum, facilitating communication between the living and the dead. With every successful contact, my confidence grew as did my conviction that I was meant to resolve the unrest that lingered in the asylum. The turning point came one night when, under the flickering candlelight of the common room, I managed to contact the spirit of the young woman from my dreams. Her name was Sarah, and she had been a patient at the asylum, subjected to the cruel treatments of its founder, my ancestor. Through her, I discovered the suffering that had permeated the asylum's walls the pain and anger of countless spirits bound to the place of their torment. Determined to bring peace to the spirits, Lucas, Emma, and I finally understood the gravity of our undertaking. We were no longer merely curious college students seeking an adrenaline rush. We had become guardians of a tragic history, committed to righting the wrongs of the past. Our endeavor was fraught with peril, the malevolent spirits of the asylum resistant to our efforts. But with each spirit we helped cross over, the air within the asylum seemed to lighten, the shadows retreating inch by inch. My abilities as a medium were key to our success, and with Lucas's knowledge of the occult, 
and Emma's unwavering support, we prepared to face the darkest aspect of the asylum's legacy, the spirit of its merciless founder. In the shadowed silence of the asylum, our resolve hardened like steel. The final confrontation loomed ahead, a daunting challenge that both terrified and beckoned me. Emma, Lucas and I gathered in the common room, the epicenter of the supernatural disturbances, to strategize our approach to confronting my malevolent ancestor, the doctor whose cruel legacy had inflicted centuries of suffering. Lucas laid out ancient texts and arcane symbols, his knowledge of occult practices serving as our guide. Emma, pragmatic as ever, organized our materials, ensuring we had everything we might need, from protective talismans to emergency first aid supplies. I, with my newfound abilities, served as the bridge to the spirit world, our primary weapon against the darkness we faced. As night enveloped the asylum, we began our ritual. Lucas chanted in a language as old as time, his voice steady. Emma and I joined hands, forming a circle around the Ouija board, the conduit through which I would confront the doctor. I called out to the spirit world, my voice echoing through the dilapidated halls, inviting the doctor to communicate. The planchette stirred to life, skittering across the board with a will of its own, spelling out a chilling welcome. The air grew colder, and the shadows deepened, coalescing into the figure of a man. The doctor, recognizably aristocratic even in death, regarded us with an arrogance that had not faded with time. His voice, when it came, was like ice, a sharp contrast to the warmth of Sarah and the other benign spirits. You cannot comprehend the greatness of my work, he proclaimed, his spirit radiating malevolence. I centered myself, drawing upon every ounce of my abilities, and engaged the doctor in a battle of wills. The room trembled with the force of our confrontation, unseen energy swirling around us in a tempest of psychic power. Emma and Lucas focused their energy, reinforcing our protective circle, their unwavering support lending me strength. The clash was monumental an ethereal struggle that transcended physicality. I reached into the depths of my being, to the place where my abilities and the spirit world converged. There, I found the courage and the power to stand against the doctor. With a final, determined push, I severed the tie that bound him to our world, casting his spirit into the oblivion where he could no longer harm the living or the dead. A sudden calm descended on the asylum the oppressive atmosphere lifting like a fog at sunrise. The benign spirits that had been trapped there, including Sarah, whispered their thanks as they faded from view, their presence no longer a source of fear, but of peace. In the aftermath, we stood together, allies who had faced the unknown and emerged victorious. The asylum, though still a shell of sorrow, was no longer a place of torment. We had freed countless souls, including my own from the burden of a dark legacy. Our journey had forever changed us. For me, the acceptance of my psychic abilities and the responsibility that accompanied them marked the beginning of a new path. With Emma's pragmatism and Lucas's knowledge at my side, I vowed to use my gift to protect others from the unseen dangers that lurk in the shadows. The story of the asylum became a testament to our resolve, a haunt no more, but a cornerstone of our bond and the starting point of our mission. Together, we stepped into the light of a new dawn, guardians of the boundary between the living and the dead, ready to face whatever mysteries the world held next.